It's nice to see some very familiar faces in the crowds. It's great. Um, no, I appreciate the invitation, and uh, it's a real a, a privilege to be here again and uh, yeah, share with you some of the work we've been doing over the last few years uh, in Chicago, uh, not just in Chicago, but with collaborators around the world, which has been fantastic. And uh, obviously, in full transparency, just a small disclosure, I have some relevant activities outside the body of the work that I'll present today as a, as a consultant for a small medical startup, but nothing that I present will be uh, associated with that work. Um, I guess just to begin, really, we, uh, a lot of this data will be very US-centric, but uh, from around the world, we know that so about roughly 4 million people a year will seek care from the emergency medicine department in the US, and gr that probably grossly underestimates the number of people that have actually been injured because not everyone will go to the emergency medicine department following the motor vehicle collision. But of the CDC data, we, we can clearly see we spend an awful lot of money roughly $100 billion on indirect costs in the states for motor vehicle collisions, and roughly $30 billion would be targeted for medical and rehabilitative schemes. Well, the story is not much different in this part of the world, looking at um, an epoch of data, about $1.5 billion in New South Wales over that decade. Um, in Queensland, about $350 million uh, spent on this, and certainly UK data is not much different, One point, or about $3 billion pounds per year is spent uh, on this particular condition. So no doubt we have an economic burden here. And I think one of the things that I've always been interested in is learning from some of our engineering colleagues is what do we know about the pathomechanics of the actual injury? Um, and, and you know, if you think about someone minding their own business sitting um, at a red light and they get hit from behind in roughly 200 milliseconds, we may see this rapid sort of hyperextension flexion type injury. Now clearly a properly positioned head restraint would go a long way to prevent some of that rapid movement in the head. And if we look at some of the in vivo and in vitro data that's been um, performed over the years in engineering applications and cadaver uh, studies, we see sort of this non-physiological motion that occurs in the spine. And it's been widely believed for many years that this abnormal non-physiological S-shaped curve that occurs could be one of the reasons why and how certain tissues get damaged, in particular, the posterior elements of the Zygapoff seal joint and a compression type injury, or even perhaps a distraction type injury to the anterior tissues, anterior longitudinal ligaments, possibly uh, vascular tissue, and maybe even, dare I say, the cord itself. So there's been lots of thoughts about this, and no doubt this is probably much of the genesis behind what we see uh, in the science of safer and smarter cars. No doubt cars are becoming safer, and seat geometry is improving throughout the world, uh, which would probably go a long way at preventing some of these injuries, which we've learned from our engineering colleagues. So at the end of the day, really a properly positioned head restraint might be a first target to potentially prevent injuries in some of these folks. But as I've learned from my engineering applications beyond this, um, this sort of question of smarter seats is, well, why then do some people continue to have problems? Why do they transit from acute to chronic pain-related disability following a, a relatively simple motor vehicle collision? So it opens up the door for a whole host of candidate lesions. We, we've seen from cadaver-based studies that the annulus could be torn. Uh, there is some potential evidence that there's bleeding inside the joint. There could be evidence of uh, subchondral bone fractures or articular fractures uh, that are noticed at post-mortem. And certainly that is great from an engineering perspective of helping us understand what could happen, but at the heart of a clinician is understanding what has happened, what has happened to this particular patient. And you could make the argument that we're very fortunate in the Western world because we have lots of imaging applications available to us, whereby we can potentially identify lesions to ligamentous tissues, discal tissues, and somewhat scant, if you will. Maybe kyphotic deformities or loss of lordosis could help explain some of these changes. And then lastly, what is widely acknowledged around the world that the uh, Zygapoff seal joint could be a pain generator. And therefore, that opens it up for targeted medical treatments such as medial branch blocks, intra-articular facet blocks, radio frequencies, which many of you, if not all of you in the room, are fully aware of. But we could argue that even though we have imaging applications available to us, the actual accurate identification, consistent identification of these particular tissues and lesions has actually been fairly poor. That doesn't mean that something hasn't happened, it just means we haven't really had the resolution to identify those tissues on a consistent basis. So, you know, the natural question becomes is, well, where is it and potentially where are they? Lesions to help explain some of these ongoing symptomatologies in these patients. And, you know, the literature will tell us that there is 
converging evidence that a peripheral lesion has occurred and, and can occur in these folks. But on balance, there's also divergent evidence that a lesion may not actually be prerequisite to develop some of these symptomatologies. And it opens up a whole new door of, of research of looking at some of the other factors that could be involved in this. And I, clearly, everyone in the room understands the biopsychosocial model. I'm, I'm not telling anybody anything new. I, I guess I've always been sort of a card-carrying member of the biology club, where I've focused on sort of the potential pathologies and the pathomechanics, et cetera, maybe some of these morphological changes that we see in muscle. But it wasn't really until I came to UQ to learn about interactions of these multiple factors that could go on and helping to understand some of these, uh, uh, the genesis, if you will, and the maintenance of these ongoing symptoms. So while we focus a lot on the potential pathologies, I hope from my talk today that you'll see we're not just a one, a one trick pony, really. We're looking at lots of different factors that are going on with these. So what else do we know? I think putting it into context of a clinician, if you were to see sort of 20 some odd patients next month, uh, we look at some of the epidemiological data from Linda Carroll and her group in Canada, that if of these 20 some odd patients who come to your clinic, we, we should expect 50, roughly 50% of them to spontaneously recover, usually within the first two to three months following the motor vehicle collision or the, the minor trauma, if you will. But by simple maths, 50% won't recover, and there's been consistently across, largely generated here in Australia, North America, other parts of the world, that there's a roughly 20 to 25% of this population that has a much more complex presentation, and that's generated lots of questions for us. And everyone in this room knows these, that these folks tend to have a little bit more of a high initial pain presentation. Does my microphone kind of go in and out? Why didn't you say something? Sorry. Can you, can you hear me OK back there, or is it? Right. OK, great. I, I get this feeling that I'm really loud, and then I go really soft like this. But just want to make sure you can hear me. So we know that high initial pain is involved. We know that they're processing sensory information in a very different way in widespread fashion. There's lots of evidence coming out of post-traumatic stress response in these folks, and no doubt they don't turn their head as well. And then I just put in italics genetics. And I'm not a geneticist by any means, uh, but there is lots of work being done in the genetic aspect. And I will talk a little bit about the epigenetics that has me sort of wondering what could be going on with these folks. But what else do we know about uh, these individuals that transit? And I, I point to Dave Walton, who you all know. It's a great picture of Dave. I'm sure he's very happy that I'm using that in this picture that'll be on YouTube at some point, I'm sure. Uh, but nonetheless, Dave uh, systematic reviews has shown us that, geez, we really don't have a lot of confidence in the effect of some of these aspects on outcomes in whiplash. And that could be impact direction, how they're seated in the car, uh, their awareness of the collision and their headrest in place or not. I, I guess I would argue that it's probably because we don't have good quantitative metrics for understanding some of these things. Now, I'm, I'm not in this space at all, but I think it's worthy of mentioning that there's an awful lot of work looking at sort of um, uh, black box data. So every car that has an airbag, the bullet vehicle does the um, impact. Uh, you can actually extract some of that black box data to see how the car is engaged. Was it an undercarriage, overcarriage? How fast was it going? The change in velocity, et cetera. So maybe down the road, as smarter cars come more available, maybe we have more quantitative metrics. And this won't surprise anyone that we actually have a fairly high litigious society in America. I don't know if you knew that. So that, that is very hard to capture. Um, uh, we are working with some folks in Canada who um, have a little bit more access to that particular data. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with regards to um, quantifying the parameters of the collision itself and what actually does happen potentially to the, the occupants of the vehicle. But then Dave also nicely shows us that we do have high confidence in many of these factors in helping us understand this. So things like high initial pain intensities, high neck-related disability, signs of post-traumatic stress, and then catastrophizing, and certainly uh, cold hypersensitivity and mechanical hypersensitivity. So all of these things we're starting to have more confidence in and understanding that perhaps the clinician should be collecting some of this data. Now, clearly, you don't uh, probably have available to you the ability to go out and buy an expensive machine to measure cold hypersensitivities or mechanical hypersensitivity, but those other factors we can certainly collect uh, relatively easy in our clinical practice. And that, I guess, gets into where I'm most interested, is understanding the mechanisms of what's driving some of these things and how do they all interact with one another. <laughs> 
So, you know, I'm paying credence to work that's been done here. Uh, this new clinical prediction rule for whiplash, which you're probably all very well familiar with, maybe this helps in the clinical practice. And I think I'm, I'm summarizing an awful lot of work in just one or two slides, so no disrespect to that whatsoever, but for sake of time, Carrie Ritchie and Michelle and others here have shown us that this dual trajectory recovery pathway could become a reality. And there's a derivation of that that was published a couple years ago showing that folks who are a little bit older, 35, I'll be 46 this year, so I guess I'm stuffed, um, as Michelle has told me earlier, thanks. But folks who are a little bit older, right, uh, initial higher levels of pain-related disability, and signs of hyperarousal on the post-traumatic diagnostic scale. So pretty good accuracy statistics as far as ruling that condition in, but some, some potential challenges like most of these rules with ruling it out. Uh, but the probability of determining full recovery was in the presence of lower levels of pain-related disability and younger age. So again, good specificity, uh, sensitivity is a little bit low, but we have some more confidence. And then Carrie's recently published the external validation to that to look at those same factors and show that um, we can increase our positive predictive value to roughly 90 some odd percent, same sort of accuracy statistics of ruling it in and ruling it out. And then ultimately full recovery can be um, predicted with uh, increased positive predictive value. So that's really an exciting sort of area of research from a clinical perspective of understanding, well, what, what could we identify in the clinical practice to give us more confidence of who's who? And then it sort of stems off into some of the work that we did uh, earlier uh, during my PhD here, uh, strictly based on clinical observations of, you know, I'm a physiotherapist, I'm working in Boulder, Colorado, I see all these MRIs, and I knew absolutely nothing about MRI, except they were really pretty pictures. And I showed all my radiology friends, what do you think of this? And uh, this equally won't surprise anybody, but in the States, they said, yeah, that's fat, but it's probably just because they're obese people. Now, that's hard to believe, too, because we're very fit in America. We're, we're very, you know, but, but to be fair, I lived in Boulder, Colorado, and it's a very fit population. But those clinical observations really generated my desires to pursue a PhD and work in an interdisciplinary environment to learn more techniques to understand how to quantify some of these changes. So summarizing a bit about a decade of that work, what we found is this sort of widespread changes in muscle degeneration, if you will, or muscle fat, I guess. A pretty simple way to quantify these changes on a T1-weighted image and looking at these changes, and what we're seeing here is that in the chronic whiplash, we're finding a widespread change in fat percentage, but it was really muscles that were more situated closer to the spine that we found greater changes in, and clearly that generated lots of hypothesis early days. We didn't see that characteristic picture in the controls, and it seemed that body mass index and various anthropometric factors didn't influence the amount of fat inside the muscle. So it, again, it generates lots of questions, usually more questions than answers back in those days, um, but nonetheless got us onto this idea of, sure, these changes appear to be unique to folks who have chronic problems, three months to three years was our catchment, but obviously more questions arose, and that was what about non-traumatic neck pain? So we looked at office workers who had non-traumatic neck pain, clearly they didn't have as much pain-related disability as our whiplash folks, but what was fascinating about it is that even though they had some uh, levels of fat in their muscles, when we looked at C3 to C7, there was really a, a pretty significant finding here, and that if you were had fat of about 24% or less, you were in membership to that non-traumatic neck pain team. And that was interesting because it mirrored our folks with uh, healthy controls. So it appears that traumatic factors seem to be involved for whatever that means at this stage. Could it be inflammation? Could it be denervation? We're not entirely sure back in 2008. So that was the wonderful opportunity to come to Brisbane and live here and work with Michelle and others on my postdoc. And my postdoc was really I think we were pretty enthusiastic in that we could get patients within a few hours after the motor vehicle collision at Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital. And I, and I earned a huge amount of respect for the life of an emergency room physician, right? We're dealing with strokes, we're dealing with heart attacks, and then whiplash, right? And so nonetheless, I think we were pretty successful. We were able to get these folks in a scanner within about one month of their injury or shortly before. We followed them up at three months, six months. We did a co-registered MRI on them, and we also collected some bloods, but I won't present that data with you here today. But why we wanted to do this is to see is if traumatic factors drive this, 
is it possible that every single person who's exposed to a minor event in a motor vehicle collision, would they all develop these fatty changes and these atroph atrophic changes in the muscles, or would it be unique to the folks that seem to be on that poor trajectory? And what was fascinating is, lo and behold, we did find it. Four weeks, there really wasn't much of a difference in the muscles, but the ones who had higher initial pain were the ones that started to express these changes. And I'm being a bit rude by throwing that line in there, but it's just a visual reminder for me that maybe these folks are slightly above that 24% index, if you will. So this was roughly 27 some odd percent of our population in that particular study that showed these characteristic signs in their muscles. And this was the total muscle of the extensors. But what was also fascinating to me is while we were on the pain intensity aspect of it, it really was the mediation effect of post-traumatic stress. And that was the first time I started to understand that, geez, there's something else going on here that could explain some of these changes in these folks. So thinking about going forward, the nice thing to do with this is to try and replicate it in another area. So while we found these changes one month to three months seem to be unique to the folks who transit on to uh, having poor functional recovery, we still have lots of questions. And one of those is, well, what if we use more advanced but available MR imaging applications? I've been very fortunate in my career. I'm not an MR physicist. I'm not a radiologist, but I've worked with physicists. Leaving UQ, working with Graham and his group, and then going to Chicago and working with uh, a gentleman named Todd Parrish, who's an MR physicist uh, in Chicago, got me onto this idea of using fat water separation. And I'm being kind of visual here, but thinking about fat and water spinning at different frequencies, a lot of this work is stemmed from the liver. But we started to use it in the muscle tissue, where fat and water are out of phase, where we get a fat sort of only or opposed and in phased images, and then where fat and water are in phase. So along this echo train, we can collect data at a very rapid pace and try to resolve some of these changes in the muscles. While I'm fascinated, this is a Chicago population now, and we, w how we work in Chicago is my lab is in the emergency medicine department, part of it is, uh, and we recruit all of our subjects, very similar to Royal Brisbane Hospital, uh, but we tend to get them, as soon as they've been screened, medically uh, screened, they don't have a fracture, et cetera, or there's no other sort of orthopedic injury, then we step in, and we get them in the scanner within about seven days, which is pretty typical. Um, and then we follow them at two weeks and three months. But we found very similar findings to what we saw in Brisbane. And that is, this moderate to severe group, based on their neck disability index score, was the one that seemed to develop these changes on a, on a different sequence of MR, fat water separation. But what's fascinating to me is where, again, it was 20 some odd percent of the population, but, and while this was not part of this particular study, I rang up Michelle and I said, I think this is pretty fascinating. If we look back at these folks, every single one that was on that severe trajectory met that clinical prediction rule, which was really interesting to me. They all were a little bit older, they had an NDI score initial of 40% or higher, and they all had some signs of post-traumatic stress, in particular arousal. And then, interestingly enough, the folks who were on the full trajectory pathway seemed to meet that clinical prediction rule to identify someone who's likely to recover anyway. So that's fascinating. If we look at our ROC analysis, we, we had some pretty good sensitivity specificity with identifying this at two weeks. This is based on the muscle fat measures, but again, more importantly, from a clinical perspective, they all met that clinical prediction rule. It's never gonna be perfect, I understand that, but in this particular study, it was pretty interesting to see that. I think also to me, in, in the last line in that study, what we ended up saying is that perhaps imaging protocols beyond sort of screening out medical fractures, et cetera, once that's been done, not everybody needs an expensive MRI. <laughs> you know, the vast majority of these patients probably don't need that. But in a certain population, perhaps this is warranted. So I guess the other thing for me that's, that's interesting in, in working with our radiologists is that the likelihood of, in, of um, incorporating sort of a uh, plus or minus 15 minute T1 weighted scan onto an already busy roster is not very likely. But what we can do with this, all being well with the patient, is in roughly five to six minutes time, capture the same amount of data. So this does that give us a time savings uh, and potentially translating that to a clinical practice. But of course, more questions. And some of those questions stem around, are we measuring fat? And one of my PhD students, this is a typical conversation I have with Andrew on a daily basis. He's a lovely boy, he's a very clever guy, he's a physio, he's doing a PhD in neuroscience, and he says to me one day, hey Jim, I really wanna 
I, I really want to work in an animal model and try and validate that, that muscle fat that you've been saying. I say, well, yeah, Andrew, that's great, but we just got this big grant through the NIH. We've got to really work on the grants. I need you to focus on that. He says, oh, yeah, 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 I'll do that, but I really want to validate some muscle fat with an animal model. So he's quite pushy, actually. I said, Andrew, I hear you, but you need to work on the grant. He says, OK, yeah, that's right, Jim, I'm on it. But would it be OK if I did some imaging work with the animal model? So I said, right, Andrew, off you go. So bless his heart, he went to our local, I guess, similar abattoir about 3 in the morning on the south side of Chicago, uh, knocked on their door and said, I'm a PhD student at Northwestern University. I'd like to get some pig muscle. And these guys kind of rough and guts sort of guys. They said, yeah, no problem. Here you go. So they cut off a big slice of freshly killed pig, and he put it in his little box got on the L train, came back, met him about 4.30 in the morning, and we stuck a pig in the scanner. It was great. And Todd was there to help us out. Our pathology department was there to help us out. But we also added a rabbit to it as well. And what I was really fascinated to see is that, and I'm summarizing a lot of work into a couple slides, but we actually had pretty good agreement there. There was no significant difference in the amount of fat that we were measuring on MR compared to histology. And most importantly, that didn't seem to be influenced by field strength. So we did 1.5 Tesla and 3 Tesla for both animals. So that was Andrew's first paper, and he was obviously very, very pleased. I guess the moral of the story is I need to listen to my students a little bit more um, and make sure that uh, we go in the right direction. But I was very pleased with this because it did solidify in my mind that we're probably getting a pretty good representative measure of uh, fatty changes in muscles. But back to the human model, which we're all interested in, is, OK, now we've seen these changes sort of one week to two weeks following the injury uh, that seems to be relatively important for predicting this outcome. Uh, but what about mechanisms, and what could be happening? And I think, talking to Michelle and others, there's lots of available measures that we could use to, to understand where these people sit and how they experience pain in their individual life. And I'm reminded of this sort of scene. Like, you can just imagine you're on holiday, you're enjoying it, you're probably having a drink, just looking out at this beautiful wilderness, and then something comes out and bites you on the, on the arm, and you think, oh, geez, that's OK. And I don't know, if you're like me, I tend to worry a lot about things and think, oh, that's not good, and start to rub it, and it gets inflamed, and all this sort of stuff. But thankfully, I think I'm a pretty active coper with these sorts of things, until I start to remember that, geez, this beautiful scene in the wilderness, every single creature out there is trying to kill and eat one another. And I start to get a little freaked out about life, like, Jesus, I'm looking over my shoulder and that. And it reminds me of this, sort of like the survival of the fittest in an evolutionary sort of perspective, right? That mouse is running for its life. And I'm sure it's not worried about how hungry it is. It's trying to get away from the fox. And let's say he gets away from the fox. And it's ingrained in his memory, this whole traumatic experience that he had to deal with in escaping that uh, fox to get back to home and put it in a personal context, I wouldn't have a clue where I was on the 11th of October, 2001. But I could tell you exactly where I was on the 11th of September, 2001. I was in Liverpool Royal Hospital. I just put some milk in my tea, and I'll never forget the hospital administrator coming up to me and giving me the news that there had been a tragic event. It's in my brain. I will never forget it. Why? Because it threatened our survival, and it was a traumatic sort of thing for all of us around the world. Uh, some more than others, obviously. And I'm starting to think, and I'm not a psychologist, no way will I uh, give you the impression that I am, but these strong emotions can strengthen our memory formations, right? And these sort of flashbulb memories, albeit they won't be very clear. I can't tell the exact specifics of what type of tie I was wearing that day, but I have it ingrained in my mind about that traumatic event. And maybe vividly storing this information about these dangers could help us get away from the fox, because we know there's one in the bushes over here somewhere. Or it could harm us by constantly thinking about it. And it got me thinking about the influence of stress. And this study came out a couple years ago. Olaf Dalkvist Leinhardt, he's a physicist at Linköping University in Sweden. And they did this lovely study on fibromyalgia. And what they found with fat water separation and um, uh, MR spectroscopy, that there is some changes in the quadricep muscles of folks with chronic fibromyalgia. Granted, it's not a huge study, but it's fascinating to see that their thoughts were is perhaps this represents some metabolic changes at the muscle cell level, or it could be related to inactivity. And when I asked Olaf, yeah, but what about the, the influence of stress? And I'm generally speaking about stress here, and an ingrained memory in their mind about their traumatic event or their ongoing predicament in life, that they have chronic pain, and nobody seems to have any answers for them. So it started us off on a little bit of a hunt. And this was this idea of do muscle changes 
occur in the muscles, peripheral muscles, in whiplash. So that has no scientific value, that slide whatsoever. It just means we can color muscles and make them look somewhat pretty. But we did a small pilot to get some pilot data to get, get our grant, and that grant was uh, successful as a result of this. But if we looked at our recovered subject, recovered based on the criteria that we used, we see basically four times the magnitude, this is an N of two here, and I understand that, of fat inside the calf muscles. And that was really something that generated lots of questions for me is, what is driving these changes in the periphery as well? Surely the injury is here, local to the neck, but something's going on in the system. So in looking at mechanisms, probably the best advice I got, well, I got a lot of good advice on my postdoc, but some of the best advice I got before I left Brisbane and moved back to Chicago was, go ahead and stick your nose out there. Take a stance on something, stick with it, and don't deviate from it. Stick with it and study it. So I say spinal cord injury with a huge query mark. I don't want anyone to think that Jim said whiplash is a spinal cord injury. That's not what I'm saying. The true definition is you know, the facet joints jump each other and you've got damage to the cord, you've got characteristic signal changes in MR on the cord that would indicate true damage. But so I took that advice from my advisor on my postdoc and I said, all right, I'm gonna stick my nose out there and I'm gonna hang on this idea that potentially mild damage to the cord could occur based on the mechanics of the injury, a typical rear end vector or a side vector impact that maybe descending or ascending pathways could be damaged. So this is where you work with your physics, physics team, right? And you say, okay, I wanna image the cord. Gary Cowan, who was at UQ, um, was very helpful early days to look at things like spectroscopy in the cord, and I quickly learned that spectroscopy can be challenging. Uh, no doubt people swallow, no doubt the cerebral spinal fluid moves, and you gotta do lots of shims in there, and things worked out okay, but we were never able to replicate that in Chicago. We just couldn't do it, and I don't know why we couldn't do it. So Todd Parrish, our um, uh, physicist, said, well, why don't we try magnetization transfer imaging, which has long been standing in sort of brain imaging, multiple sclerosis, ALS, other things like this, or motor neuron disease. So we started looking at the cord, and where it's pretty interesting is it gives you good contrast between gray and white matter. So we can look at ventromedial, dorsolateral, and dorsal pathways. And what we've been doing with this has been kind of fun. So I, again, I'm not a physicist, but I think about explaining this in, in sort of lay terms. Basically, you have two sort of uh, pools of water, and you've got this freely moving water, and then you've got other uh, protons that are bound to macromolecular proteins, lipids, et cetera, myelin. Well, the free water has a very nice long T2 time, and that allows us to get good contrast and capture an image of these um, tissues or these protons. Whereas the bound water to macromolecular has a very short T2 time. It's very hard to image those things. So maybe the, the lay analogy is using a sledgehammer with a um, off-resonance pulse to allow those protons to interact with these freely moving protons. And then you saturate the water pool, and that allows us to get some type of an assemblance of potentially the myelin or the integrity of that myelin in that particular tissue. So a lower ratio of this could indicate demyelinization. And we've seen this in spinal cord injury with Julian Cohen Adad in Canada. And what we found for our pilot, this is just three severes, one recovered, one control, is that the three severes had uh, a lower ratio uh, in the white matter pathways, suggestive that there could be changes in the cord. And that, again, mirrored some mean data uh, from Cohen and Dodd's work in spinal cord injury. So we used that as a basis to get our grant um, uh, a little bit more uh, power, if you will, uh, to support our position. But it still doesn't answer to me, what do these changes represent? You know, I think we all agree that there could be some ongoing peripheral nociception from some peripheral injury to some tissue. We don't really truly know, and we know that the dorsal horn is processing pain in a very different way in these folks. But what about reductions in central activation, so their inability to produce torque in the periphery? Is this due to some type of damage to the cord, the severity of which, I don't know. Is it disuse-induced atrophy, like Olaf and his group thought in fibromyalgia? Or is there some ongoing stress system that's causing some of these changes to, to stimulate and differentiate muscle into fat? So these are the things that we started studying, and I teamed up with a fellow named George Hornby at the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, who only studies stroke and spinal cord injury. So in looking at these folks a little bit deeper, 
We noticed that they had brisk reflexes in their lower extremity. They had some signs of clonus when you pang down their ankle. Um, no signs of Babinski or anything like that. But I said, George, let's test this. So we just did twitch interpolation techniques, so central activation ratios. We have them in our little biodex. We say, push, 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 give them verbal encouragement, and give them a little stimulus. And what we're seeing is, in, this is one subject here, with a massive increase in the amplitude. So that means the electrically elicited torque was higher than their volitional torque. But in our recovered subjects, we don't see that. We see that they can generate lots of torque about the ankle. And clearly, that's some preliminary evidence that suggests that, well, geez, maybe there is something involving descending pathways in these folks. We haven't ignored ascending pathways. We're not ignoring the sensory aspect. I'm just taking that advice I was given to stick your nose out, and I'm more interested in looking at the motor aspect of these folks, what's happening here. So perhaps we can differentiate some of these folks based on some clinical measures that are giving us some insight as to what their nervous system is looking like. So to summarize these uh, particular chronic folks, it appears that they have more fatty changes inside their calf muscles. It appears that they're not able to volitionally maximally produce torque about their ankle. And it appears that they have some regional changes inside the cord um, with magnetization transfer imaging. But some preliminary findings could help support this. I've got some really great uh, PhD students. Mark is a, is a physicist. He's a medical physicist. He's doing his PhD in biomedical engineering right now. This is part of one of our larger studies. We have, uh, our goal is 100 subjects that we're recruiting for a prospective study. We scan them at multiple time points, one week, two months, three months. We'll follow them out to a year. We have 35 subjects in that study now that have gone through three months, and then I think five, four or five have gone through one year. And Mark's whole idea in life is to look at the cord and try to perfect some of this imaging in various pathways. I like the way he presents his data as this is five healthy controls, five recovered, and five with chronic whiplash. And we're just trying to get an idea of the homogeneity of that contribution of signal from magnetization transfer. And what we're finding is that it's fairly homogeneous amongst the recovered and controls. But in this small sample, we see this sort of variability suggesting that maybe there's changes in regional aspects of the cord that would be indicative of white matter pathways. And then you have to ask yourself the question, well, so what? I mean, does this actually relate to their ability to produce torque and their functional strength? And does it actually even compare to incomplete spinal cord injury? So a brief look at Andrew's paper here. He's a physio doing a PhD in neuroscience. And what we're finding is that our control subjects, they can produce all the torque we ask them to. There's no twitch interpolation changes. Whiplash, albeit better than in complete spinal cord injury, is certainly much smaller. I have the range of values that are available if you have any questions about that. But it is interesting to see that there is a sample of these folks that look to be um, unable to maximally produce torque about their ankle. And it seems to be very consistent with incomplete spinal cord injury. So Andrew's looking at the cord imaging as well, and it, we're just measuring the reduced side, if you will, not to suggest that whiplash is a laterality effect like you might expect in stroke. But what we are finding is that on one side of the uh, ventrolat or dorsolateral pathways, that there is a reduction in their MT compared to controls, and that's significant, but there's no difference on the other side of the cord. So maybe this is honing in on specific regions of the cord that could be involved. When we look at their plantar flexion cars, so their ability to produce torque, we see on that side where there was a reduced signal, an inability to produce torque about their ankle, that's significantly different than controls, and um, no different to incomplete spinal cord injury. So granted, the incomplete spinal cord injury, as expected, are much lower, but our whiplash are much lower than the healthy controls and recovers. So it's generating lots of thoughts. Granted, it's still too early. We're, we're taking this out a little bit further to try and understand what this really means. And it'll be fascinating to see what it means when we look at the, uh, at the end of this uh, a big study. I guess to me, it, it, maybe some of these measures are helping us to characterize this patient who's at risk following that dual trajectory pathway that's been published now and validated. It's quite interesting to look at that data. Perhaps we're informing clinical practice through this global effort to try and uh, improve our assessment and management strategies. That to me is very important that avoid stigmatizing these patients as what not everybody, but what some would say is clearly a psychosomatic illness with non injury or non organic factors. But then again, I think with the vast majority of these folks, we advise them to allow natural recovery to occur. I don't have that answer yet. I'm not sure we do. 
but it could potentially, at least in our part of the world and others, circumvent the delivery of potentially very unnecessary assessments and treatments that maybe actually contribute to iatrogenic disability and problems. So ultimately, our goal is this high-risk patient population that, that we've talked about and a lot of people know about, not just for whiplash, but certainly other musculoskeletal conditions, and using some of these. I, like, I don't think anything we're doing is all that innovative. I think what we are doing is that we're combining available measures in an innovative way to try and find out what's happening. So again, this biopsychosocial aspect, and I was having a coffee with Michelle before we came over here, and now that we're in Chicago, it's still, uh, we're about a third of the way through that particular study, it's fascinating to just sort of take a landscape view of your data. And that landscape view of the data, this is a very different patient population. Um, we, in Australia, had primarily a, a Caucasian population. In, in Chicago, we have a nice mix of African American, Hispanic, Asian, and um, um, Caucasian. But what's fascinating to me is that a lot of our folks come from lower socioeconomic status neighborhoods, right? They have no doubt probably a lot of stress in their life, uh, the dailies of trying to make things happen. But when we look at our data, the majority of the folks that are on that poor trajectory have um, passive coping styles, they have a lot of depression, and they all seem to have post-traumatic stress following this particular event. So it seems to be going down that pathway a little bit. We'll see how it plays out at the end of it, but it's really fascinating to see a cultural difference there. Um, we are also looking at the genetics of this. I do collect bloods from these folks in the acute stage, and, and we send it off to a colleague of ours in North Carolina. But I'm really interested in looking at the epigenetics of this as well and how that sort of cultural influence could drive these and turn these genes on and off, if you will. From a future perspective, and I don't even think it's appropriate to say future, to be honest with you, but what is going on in the brain? I'm, I don't do a lot of imaging. In fact, I do no imaging of the brain at this stage of the game. But we do see a lot of submissions to journals and a lot of work being done in that space. Uh, Todd in Chicago is very much involved in a lot of neuroimaging applications, but looking at the quantification of brain uh, pathways in a three-dimensional perspective, whether it's using structural or functional uh, MR and looking at some of these changes. We do a lot of work with stroke where we know where the lesion is, um, or our group does. Uh, but I think in the chronic pain literature, there's a lot that needs to be done uh, to, to get a better handle on what's happening. But no doubt that's coming down the pike. Um, and to me, it, it's sort of a nice invitation to continue to work in an interdisciplinary fashion to sort of figure some of these changes out. Um, obviously, our work is supported by the NIH, and um, I'm really grateful for that and to, uh, to be back here in, in um, Australia to present some of this data. I'll be uh, leaving to go home soon, as you can tell. I'll be bringing my friends back with me. Um, God, that is amazing, isn't it? I'm glad everybody got that. Like, boo and pistol, they're pretty cute, aren't they? Amazing. Anyway, really just a big thanks to the lab and, and colleagues around the world, and I really want to thank Michelle and Conrad and, and Viv for organizing this talk, and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions or have a chat about anything you'd like. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.